style in my work where I always wanted to include more and more food um, and like there could almost be never enough food. So uh, it kind of pushed me to come up with this idea that my installations would never be finished. They could grow and change each time I set them up, much like a scene in any home that changes from day to day to an event to event. These tables, still lives would get taken down and then rearranged and new objects would come in. Um, so this table is, is taking a tour in quite a few places um, with new different arrangements. My mom also taught this phrase to me, which is the title of the cutting board, phrase, um, cutting board uh, piece in the show um, that you mentioned, my son. Panza llena corazón contento, full belly, happy heart. And I kind of like to let that guide my work as sort of like a mantra to always make something that's fulfilling and nourishing. And then this is a close-up of a, a fruit stand that was made uh, simultaneously with that table. So in general, I've always been drawn into building many objects at a time and then gradually starting to collect and arrange and rearrange these objects into various compositions and still lives. And the table setting by far has, I mean, has been probably my favorite by far. Um, I've always liked the idea of food being passed around, merged with the concept of these stories and memories being passed around, uh, represented through these various objects. So this image on the right was one of the very first ceramic tables I ever built. Um, and the image on the left is a table that we had in our house growing up that I think my dad actually built out of wood. Um, so each plate on this first table uh, carried a different story for someone in my family. And it's, it's all earthenware clay, including the table. Um, and it's, it's uh, uh, raw finished, but just a bit of shoe polish on the surface so you can see the clay. And to get a sense of scale, it's about 10 feet long by four feet wide. And I got to set it up a couple of times while in grad school and then once in a group show that we had in Philadelphia. And I sort of really like that part in this, this work, um, how it has this potential to kind of grow and change and evolve over time. This is one of my dad's plates that were in progress. I think when I started this project uh, was when I first started an Instagram account. So I have this like odd pile of images that are with this filter. So, and getting to the bindle, when thinking about my family's history, I wanted to have a symbol for migration. So the, the bindle is about moving and traveling and that sort of thing. Um, the, the first one was in that raw ceramic table and I've made a point to create a new one wherever I go. Um, so it's sort of a repeating theme that you'll find in a lot of these pieces. Um, migration is, is, you know, a very difficult subject, but I hope to like preserve a sense of hope in my work um, with these sort of like floral motifs kind of growing out of the uh, stick or the branch holding up some of these bindles. So I have certain objects that I go back to, but oftentimes when I get started in the studio, I just like start making whatever is around me to get rolling. Um, because the more objects I'm able to create in my studio, the more time I can spend learning from them and playing with them, morphing, merging them in different ways, much like the story that gets stretched over time and it's telling. You know, if someone's talking about a fish they caught and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger the way they tell it. Um, I, I, you know, you know, enjoy that kind of storytelling where things get altered. And you know, ceramics is such a tedious process. Each object not only takes a while to get through its various stages from like greenware to leather hard, bone dry, bis firing and, you know, final glaze firing and such, but you tend to have to make double to get what you want. Um, so there is a lot of making in the studio. <laughs> And then my signature piece, the ceramics tile. I really enjoy including humor more and more into my studio practice and any little thing that can cause a laugh or a smile. I feel like there's a lot of heavy things going on in the world, especially right now. So I like to add a few light things wherever I can. 
And humor creates a very important emotion. And when I can evoke a feeling from my audience, it makes the work feel more successful to me. And then here's some California love. <laughs> Another pun that I love, um, a six pack with two pop. So in theory, it's a 12 pack. <laughs> um, and then the jugs. So uh, this pair of jugs was made for a show in 2019 for Inseca. And I think they're funny because they're jugs and they have nipples on them. So, you know, there's that pun. Um, but they also carry a strong meaning for me when I think of my mother, um, you know, raising and breastfeeding 12 babies and, you know, the nourishment of being a mother in general, I think is just a pretty amazing and intense thing. Um, so the piece on the right was about her filling up these 12 cups with milk. And then this is sort of a comical piece too, because I sort of have this vague, strong memory of associating Swiss cheese with cartoons and then seeing it for the first time at a market under like deli glass and just feeling this sort of like awe and amusement with this cheese. And so I had this extra wall to fill in the show and I thought, oh, I'll just like cut up a bunch of slices of cheese and that'll be fun. <laughs> and it made me really happy. You know, life is so short, so you got to make and do what makes you happy. Um, and then this is an old phrase, um, meaning after a good taco, have a good tobacco. Um, and I'm not a smoker, and I, I don't want to promote smoking, but in my work, I like to use it as an image um, often, and I, I keep revisiting it in various iterations, and there's a couple in this show as well. Um, so it's sort of another signature item that reappears. Um, but I like to think about it as like a soft message or when it turns into clouds and then steam, it shows this sense of movement in uh, like sort of a cycle. Um, this one was one of the earlier ones way back. Um, so it kind of comes up into this dark emotional center creating these rain clouds and then settles uh, on the right into the steam of a coffee cup. Sometimes I try to attach a a new phrase to each one that I send out. Um, this one was from a line in a Shakira song, meaning I don't ask that every day be sunny. Um, and I kind of appreciate gloomy days because, you know, they're in inevitably nourishing in the end for growth. And this was an installation I made during a teaching residency in New Mexico. Um, and they are, uh, again, family portraits based on some stories my cousin was filling me in on while I was there. Um, but although my work stems from very specific stories at times, uh, my end goal is to create these visually rich installations that hopefully anyone can approach with a bit of curiosity and interaction. Visual representation comes and goes in my work, much like that story that gets stretched over time and it's telling. I want my pieces to carry that same sense of altered information while still carrying the heart of its narrative. And it also leaves me with more room to play between you know, realism and abstraction. abstraction. Um, and then getting to the tile series, I started making these tiles while I was a resident at the Archie Bray Foundation. And I think my idea for these kind of sprouted out of uh, me not wanting to like lug such large sculpture work anymore. <laughs> And I find like that can be very helpful in pushing a new body of work is giving yourself a new role or a challenge because the new role will inevitably force a, you know, a change in your work. Um, so the rule I gave myself was like, okay, I'm gonna keep it, everything's under 12 inches and flat. Um, and it turned into these tile installations. Um, this was the first iteration or the second iteration actually, I think. Um, and to be honest, it wasn't, I mean, it was just as much work as all my work, <laughs> um, but I really enjoyed them and I um, have continued to create them and I um, am really excited about them. I, this, uh, these, this installation was at the Archie Bray Foundation and it's also been um, shown in France and in Kansas City. So I kept up with the idea of this evolving installation, but the time, but this time I decided to make it available in parts because I wanted it to be more accessible for people to take, uh, you know, a piece of this pie home. And it's been kind of fun to see how it spreads too fast, how it's spread into different homes. 
um, as people send me pictures of where they have it installed in their house and which tiles they chose uh, and the new compositions they arrange with their smaller sets. And then I just get to make new tiles for the next compositions filled in with ones that don't get picked up right away. Um, and you'll see there's a few at this show that are some of my favorites, the watermelon and the flower in the water cup, I think are probably some of my most favorite ones. Um, but I love the evolution of this work because, you know, we're always evolving as people and I enjoy that sense of growth and opportunity to become better versions of ourselves. Um, so this piece is always like growing and changing to how I want it and how I feel. Um, and these are for some fried eggs on a wall. <laughs> and the only thing I really want to note on this piece is just that I really love fried eggs and I really love chickens. <laughs> Um, and I love the color yellow. So <laughs> this one, it was, you know, really just pure joy for me. Um, and this is another, you know, yellow, <laughs> yellow piece. Um, so being in the ceramics community, once in a while I get to, I get asked to make functional pots, um, but they're rare to me because I, you know, I do more sculptural work. Um, so it means that they're either pretty crappy or they're really special. <laughs> if you think about how few are made. Um, so I, I hope people see it that way. <laughs> um, these ironing boards I collected in Montana as well, um, while thrift shopping, I thought would make better pedestals for the work rather than having white blocks, which I try to avoid. And then this was another ironing board with some planters. And then Again, the jug piece was also on an ironing board. And here's a tostada, a stack of tostada plates. So this is actually one of the, the other functional projects that I do uh, that I've been, it's been sort of an ongoing in the background uh, with my installation work. Uh, I started making these pinchy little plates a few years ago with the idea that they would sort of mimic the imperfections and bumpiness of a fried tortilla. And I also like the idea that they could maybe direct people away from using a knife and fork because a tostada is meant to be eaten in your hands. And I think, you know, eating off this lumpy plate, if you tried to use a knife and fork, you'd probably feel foolish right away. Um, so here's an installation of one of the sets. But I, I really like that they're not cautious in the details, you know, they're really like loose. The brush strokes, brush strokes are quick and there's many imperfections you know, a little splash of underglaze you'll, you'll find on some of them. Um, but the process of, you know, making them and the process of using them for me was all about the simple charm of enjoying oneself without this pressure of perfection. So that's what I really love about this series. Um, whenever COVID finally becomes long gone, I'd really love to have some big tostada party show. Uh, I think that would be like the dream ending for this idea. And then getting a little bit closer to date, this past, you know, oddball year, um, these are sort of like an assortment of images from things I was tinkering with in my studio while teaching at the University of Montana, um, where I met Amanda, who wrote the essay for the show. So Amanda and I had talked about discussing my work uh, briefly before since she has had like this, you know, experience writing for Ceramics Monthly and had just happened to, by coincidence, been writing for a lot of Latino artists. <laughs> so I thought, you know, that'd be funny if she kept up with that theme and wrote for me next. Um, but the school year by, wet year went by so fast and, you know, I never really got to show her work, a body of work while I was there. Um, and then the lockdown happened and, you know, I, I moved quickly after. Um, so, you know, the work trickled out slowly. Um, and then, you know, Lysong co contacted me about doing the show and uh, if I knew anyone who could write. Uh, so immediately I thought of Amanda. Um, so, yeah, so this is just, just, again, just images of things I was fiddling with <laughs> um, in Montana. And then this was from a demo that I just like to share because it was fun <laughs> for my foundations class. Um, but getting to the work for the show, um, so basically, 
it's about a difficult conversation between generations, the premise for the show. The title, Cono Sin Cebolla, With or Without Onions, is a play between what someone would like to take on their plate in terms of food, but symbolically in terms of things such as tradition or gender roles, you know, what do you want to pass on to the next person and what should be left behind on the table? So the onions served up in that centerpiece and on the cutting board is supposed to re represent this emotion. Um, well, you know, there's some tears and um, tears, teardrops on one of the plates on the right, on the top right of the main piece. And in contrast, the piece to the left of it, um, someone has chosen, you know, this nice, you know, cucumber and lime. They've chosen a more, you know, fruitful ending. Um, while the other plates may be still, still be deciding um, what to choose, I am in a way inviting my audience to place themselves at the table and maybe think about what they would like to put on the empty plate. And then I've also singled out an empty plate that says plato on it. Um, this, this single plate, you know, has the opportunity and possibility to be served with whatever you choose. Um, you know, that's the main thing I want to get across with this idea for this show is that is having a choice. And um, so I singled out that uh, plate plato um, to highlight the importance of it in the show. And then the cutting boards are sort of the action associated with what's being placed on the table while piece. You know, the salsa is being prepared while the second one has more suggestive fruit of, you know, gender parts to kind of represent these, you know, gender roles. Um, and then lastly, a more positive and nourishing end with the hearts. Um, yeah, and that's about sums it up. Thank you. Well, now, um, let's go to Amanda. And yeah. Ask Amanda, what do you um, think of this whole thing? You know, I, mean, I think um, gender roles, tradition, culture, they're all in play. So what's your read? What is your take on this? Um, let us know. Um, so I, I've been sitting here thinking the whole time. Um, when I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about today, I, I thought about how when I was translating um, my English version of the of the essay to Spanish, uh, I, the the first sentence involves the word packing, words packing and unpacking, and in Spanish I had two choices to choose from, um, uh, empacar and desempacar, which are words that are literally meaning packing and unpacking. It's an empacar. Or um, another term that's used is hacer or deshacer, which can mean literally to make and unmake or to pack and unpack. It's more kind of a reference. Um, and that, when you talked about the, when you first act, asked about the brindle and then Christina talked about it as the symbol of uh, immigration, but also you know, it's a way of packing things up. They're also used to like pack up leftovers and send home. And I thought that was, that just dives so well with, with what I wanted to talk about with trying to decide on a translation for this word because the, the show, you know, about deciding what you want to take with you, um, Cono Sin Cebolla, uh, and, and, you know, that, that kind of concept of which traditions do you keep and which do you leave behind? Um, I decided to use the, the word empacar and desempacar because the implications of hacer and deshacer to make or unmake were more distant from the idea of the show because it's not, a, it's not an unmaking of traditions. It's just a leaving behind. Um, and so you're not unmaking the family structure. You're not unmaking your history. Um, like Christina is, is just choosing to um, embrace a, a, a lot of, so much of your work is about embracing your heritage and your history. And so to, to use the verb that like literally translates to unmake would not be appropriate. And um, so these are the things that when you're translating 
are, are very important is like what connotations does each word mean have and what kind of what baggage does it bring with it not to make it a pun but i definitely did this um, <laughs> uh, so you know i that's what i was thinking beforehand and then that just fell in so nicely with, with, with what both of you were talking about and especially because affair disaffair uh, also mean to make, and these objects are, are handmade. Um, but uh, empacar, to pack, uh, is more what you do with the work when you're taking it with you. And also um, when you're really thinking about what you want in life and where you want to go, um, I, that's really, that's more of an emotional baggage. It's more unpacking rather than unmaking because you're, you're holding on to so much. And, um, you know, and then it comes to, uh, like, you know, it's, it's food. It's so tied into gender. Like, there's no way to extract it. Uh, like, I couldn't not talk about gender roles when, when talking about this work because um, we have, even as our culture um, in, in the U.S. Um, and culture pretty much around the world, uh, like regardless of, of differences, with a few exceptions, most place women in the kitchen and with food. Uh, a lot of times from that primal like breastfeeding, we are primarily associated with nourishment and food. Um, so you will always have this like deep primal association with women and nourishment. So that, that gender role is always going to be there. Um, but uh, the, the idea of expanding it and, and inviting more people in, um, putting those gender roles on the cutting board um, and maybe considering them like, oh, what are you cutting them for? Are you making a mixed salad? <laughs> like everybody together? It is something um, that, that I thought a lot about when I was, when Christine and I were talking about the show, um, we discussed this quite a bit and when I was writing it was definitely at the top of my mind. And none of this happens without struggling a little bit. Um, so that cutting onions. Um, and that actually, when I was thinking about that yesterday, I was thinking, I, on Facebook sometimes, will see something. And whether it be something sad, something that's kind of happy in a, a joyful way, and I'll say, who's cutting onions in here? Because I'm weeping a little bit. Like it's it's a it can be a beautiful thing it can be a sad thing um, but that's become a, a kind of an English thing that we use on social media even so that idea of like leaving stuff behind can also be a relief that kind of like a cathartic thing that makes you like just release and so you've got those tears on that plate it's not necessarily a bad thing it can be that relief and leaving behind pain or, or old, almost Hatfield and McCoy, like family struggles. Um, you know, your family has made it to the U.S., um, which is not that much better right now, but um, you, you've, you know, you've gotten through so much, like you're an internationally recognized artist right now, uh, which is, you know, considering what a lot of people in this country unfortunately think about immigrants uh, you know you're proving them wrong left and right which is fantastic and um, it's, for me it that you know I wanted to to learn Spanish to better communicate and better understand other people kind of you were talking about the ceramics community um, that's what language was for me it was you know bringing you know creating a larger community having more people, more ideas. Um, and I think your work is able to do that really well because everyone knows food. Yeah. Um, there are no real cultural barriers when it comes to food. Like we all eat, um, we all understand um, the symbols in food and it, it can be read. And when you say you struggle with language even, um, you know, clearly food is a language that everybody speaks. Um, and I think you moved through that so flawlessly. 
really. Um, and it's beautiful. So just, I was so excited that you asked me to do this, um, that you invited me to, to write and talk about you because I have, I've been a fan of your work for a long time um, and I've always felt it had such a positive um, message and, you know, really, it always really spoke to me um, through that, not just the culture that I was familiar with, but like just on a personal level, it just felt, it felt at home. <laughs> well, thank you, Amanda. How about we um, just open up the, you know, the um, forum and ask everyone if they have any questions for both of you, either of you. Thanks again too, Amanda. I appreciate it. If anyone has a question for Christina, perhaps, you know, maybe a specific work that you're curious about. Um, I, do, I, would, I do wanna say Mexican food is like the national food of America, isn't it? <laughs> right? Taco Tuesday, I mean. <laughs> True. So it's uh yeah it's uh, accepted uh, Mexican culture of food is like it's in this uh it's been absorbed into an American life so you know there is no dis uh, I mean we didn't we don't have a national food in America oh, good point. There, in the U S what what would be American cuisine it's really like the food I grew up on, on is so horrible it's just meat potatoes and gravy and it has no flavor. <laughs> Like, I appreciate all of the food because it's better than what I came from. That's right. So anybody wants to ask any questions at all? If you do, you can, you can unmute yourself. Uh, well, oh, Tony? I have a question. Yes. Christina. Is Christina there? I'm here, I'm here. Hey, Christina. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for joining. Yeah, and so nice to hear you talk about your work, too. Guess who's here? Oh, hi. Uh, hey. oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I've known about your work for a long time. I've seen it here and there, but I've, you know, I've never gone this deep into it, of course, with you talking about it. It's really great. And um, I saw that table piece at the script show a year or two ago. Yeah, I'm really impressed with that. Um, I guess, I guess one of the things I would just wonder is, there are two, two things. One is, how many other materials do you engage when you make art, when you make your art, or do you? Or is, do you run everything through a kind of a ceramics lens? And then the other thing is scale. It seems like, for the most part, everything is pretty much to life scale. And I just wonder if you play with scale and other materials in your work. Sure. Um... I mean, I definitely do a lot of drawing. That's where everything starts drawing. And right. um, recently, I feel like uh, I've been interested in wood objects. So that might be something that I might get into a little bit more deeply. Um, but I mean, for the most part, once I got into clay, I kind of like was, you know, just immersed myself in clay and, you know, didn't want to do anything else really. <laughs> Uh, I mean, cause, and it is a pretty tedious process, as you know, and it takes up so much time that it, it's, it's hard to even like take on another material at times. Um, and I mean, I still feel like I'm learning about clay and different, you know, ways, things you can do with it. Um, so it has taken up, you know, majority of my time, but I definitely am interested in other materials. Um, mm -hmm. And definitely want to do more woodwork because I was starting to, you know, after teaching that foundations course in Montana and, you know, teaching my students these other materials that kind of gave me a urge to like do other things as well. Mm -hmm. So that might be something that I'll get into in this next year. Um, and the scale, I guess for the most part it is pretty up to scale. Just it would happen kind of naturally. Um, but I do think about like blowing things up uh, really big to kind of represent mm -hmm. that alteration in the story because I you know when yeah. I talk you know the fish getting bigger and bigger I feel like I need to start you know enlarging some of this food to really make it more playful and like really highlight some things um, yeah. so that's definitely been on my mind yeah 
Thank you. I'm also, I'm also sorry. We almost got you out for a residency, I think, two summers ago, and then it just didn't work. But um, we'll, just, we'll keep that in mind for the future. Yeah, we'd love to have definitely. You We'd love to come to Long Beach. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, we'd love that. Yeah, well, thank you so much. And good luck. Tony. And good luck, uh, Lysan. Oh, thank you, Tony. Yeah, yeah. So, Tony, um, that was Tony Marsh. Um, he, until recently, uh, was the, um, the head of the uh, ceramics program at the um, California State University of Long Beach. So, he's um, a well respected professor in ceramics, uh, and I think everybody who, uh, who's serious about play knows who he is. Uh, and thank you for joining us uh, uh, at this uh, session. So I have a question from somebody uh, who wants to know why you, is your heart green? You know, the massive uh, insula uh, wall installation, why is, um, why is it green? So uh, I turned it green and I gave it some little thorns to kind of show like it blending into, like I wanted to show it as a, a nobal, like the cactus, nobal, um, just to, you know, kind of give that extra layer of food. <laughs> I see, I see, I get it now. Yeah, that's great. Um, what are the, the interesting elements that you have on, on it? Uh, why is it a mini chair? Is that, it's just a symbolic of a t table setting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I wanted to throw in a little chair. <laughs> yeah, and the, what about the light bulb? The light bulb, I, you know, I think about, you know, you know, having the light bulb on your head. So there's this idea and thinking happening at this table, you know, you're making your choices. Oh, and oh, yeah, 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 that's right, that's right, yeah, yeah, got it. Uh, also, I have a question. Um, we've, we've, the show actually has been open um, since uh, Thursday. So we have been having people come in the gallery to look at your show. So there are people who have commented about how your glazes are matte rather than shiny. And also there are people who say, uh, why didn't you make your objects hyper real? You know, like a lot of people, a lot of artists do this trompe um, you know, hyper real rendition of the object. They look like real thing, um, but you don't do that. So do you, is there an intention um, behind it? Yeah, I mean, part of it is, is just my style, my hand, and um, it's sort of, um, how should I put this? It's sort of like, you know, retelling a story. Not all the details are there. It's, you know, it's a little fuzzy. So I like that fuzziness. That makes a lot of sense. I actually like, like, the, like it that way because you, it, your work has this, um, it, it's, it's odd, you know, you, it's, it's not, uh, I, I think it's kind of tired. It, it's tiresome to see uh, so many artists do this real thing as well. It's like, they're just showing, uh, the audience that they're very skilled, you know, but your, your, for me, your works are all about the ideas behind it. You know, it's not about you showing off that you can do what, you know, like fantastic things with clay. So, I mean, I think you are a bit fantastic with clay anyway, you, but you don't have to show off. <laughs> so that's not how I feel about it. Um, I think um, it's, um, I, I have Linda. something connected is Christina, do you see it as, as, like the, the actual look of it as being tied to um, your culture as well, because it reminds me so much of like um, papeles picados and a lot of the um, Dia de los Muertos style of art as well. And, and uh, yeah, maybe kind of relationship. Bit, sure, like my style has evolved from like growing up with a certain seeing the certain imagery and it's kind of like inherent in the way I kind of put things out there. Yeah, that's, that's what I thought because I, I see such a relation to a lot of the artwork that I saw in Mexico and um, for, for people who have not necessarily traveled there, you know, Coco um, did a pretty great job of that. Um, and there's definitely with the color and the line work, a relational aesthetic going on but it's it's totally definitely this is christina's version of that hi <laughs> this is my brother hi everyone i'm, I'm alex empty yeah, i'm uh, christina's uh, older brother um i had a comment on actually um i guess uh, amanda's uh, summary of it as far as packing and unpacking um part 
part of your heritage. And it was quite interesting to me to watch this and be able to pick up on some elements from growing up and stuff that um, maybe not be so obvious and I haven't thought about in a while. And it's like, oh, I know, I know what that is. And, and being able to connect that to obviously our own shared history um, and things that I maybe haven't packed kind of. So I appreciate it. It's, it's really cool. Thanks, Alex. And it looks like you, you're packing or unpacking right now too, quite literally. Uh, yeah, kind of. <laughs> it's it's Boy Scout popcorn. So. For the whole I love that stuff. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I miss we have that. <laughs> I thought you were building a fort. <laughs> okay, so a question um, from somebody in the gallery asking about the tears or the water. So I'm not sure whether you actually went um, uh, uh, did have any discussion about that in your presentation? Oh, sure. I, I forgot about that one. Um, so uh, the last time I went to Mexico, somebody was telling me, like, if you dream about your teeth falling out, um, some, that means someone close to you is going to die. <laughs> and I just had this horrifying image in my mind of, like, you know, teeth falling out. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it was starting out as this water uh, glob, and it, to me, it also kind of looked like, you know, a cartoon, like a spit, <laughs> and then there's these tears. Um, so that, that was that sort of image, and I thought it kind of tied out well with, like, the table, because, you know, there's, you know, there are tears in the table setting um, that match up with those tears in this water piece. Um, and then also thinking about past generations, I wanted to include, you know, the, that teeth, the teeth that could be, you know, ancestors. Mm. All right. Thank you. Also, Chris, uh, Connie Griffiths um, made a comment about you, um, your work. She said it has a retro look that makes it special. Uh, it's in the chat. I think everybody can see it. Um, thank you, Connie. Um, so if anyone uh, have any more questions, if not, um, we can uh, say goodbye and thank everyone for joining us today. Any you know, last words from either of you? Uh, just thank you. Big ah, thank, you. thank you to everyone for joining. It uh, has been such a, a, a fun uh, reception. Thank you so much. Um, Edith has something to say. She said, um, if everybody can read the chat, I think it's actually uh, meant for everyone. She, she said, I think the idea of this show and specifically Christina's work is very interesting, given a few things. Number one, the demographics of the US is changing so much that by 2050, minorities will represent the population majority. Number two, Mexico is a bordering country, so the cuisine is more important than most places. Uh, geography matters and permeates the US in an interesting way. Thank you, Edith. That's actually, wow. That's very important. That's very true. Yeah, very true, right? Yeah. So everyone go vote. <laughs> 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 Oops. Thank you, guys, everyone, for joining us today. Um, so the show is through October 3rd. Uh, can be viewed online and uh, in person in my gallery, uh, 4660. Uh, um, C. Harrison Avenue in Boston. Uh, thank you, Christina. Your work is amazing. I'm so proud to show you. And Amanda, thank you for agreeing to write the essay. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. All right. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.